order. You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man. Again, you're watching Sky News want to take you uh, straight back to Liverpool Crown Court, where Barry Bennell has been sentenced to 31 years for 50 counts of child sexual abuse. Andy Woodward was his first victim, abuse survivor, as he prefers to be described. He's been speaking within the last few moments. I'd just like to keep it brief uh, because the boys up there need to speak to you, but I just want to say that I'm really proud um, that I was able to speak out publicly and uh, with my uh, anonymity. Um, I'm quite nervous now because I feel mixed emotions. No sentence is long enough for that man. And right to the death, he didn't show any remorse or said sorry to anyone. And uh, anyway, I'll leave it to the rest of the guys because those guys up there will speak to you. But I'm just proud that I did speak out. And if I hadn't have done, we all wouldn't be stood here now today and I'm just uh, proud that I did it. Thank you anyway. Court for us has been uh, throughout this, uh, this hearing that has lasted many, many weeks, of course, and hasn't it? And uh, those that were abused by Benel, you were telling us earlier, once they'd given their evidence, they still came back day after day to support and comfort each other. They did every single day, Kay. We've seen these men around Liverpool Crown Court, survivors. They gave their evidence and they all, every day, came back to support the next person. Just moral support, really. This has been a harrowing trial. The evidence has been utterly, utterly appalling in places. This man, Barry Bennell, will now serve 31 years in prison. He's 64. He's in ill health, we've been told. That was his excuse for not coming to court every day. He's being fed through a tube. That will never change. But that was his excuse for not coming to court. And he did not engage in these proceedings at all. So all of his victims had to come here, give their evidence, and then the defence lawyer would try and pick apart what they were saying. Bennell did not give evidence in his own defence, but through his defence team, he let it be known that he believed that they were publicity seekers and compensation chasers. That was the phrase that was used in court. So these men have had to listen to that. They gave their version of events and the jury overwhelmingly believed them. 50 convictions against Barry Bennell on this occasion. He is now a four-time convicted paedophile and the judge was utterly damning in his sentencing remarks. He described him as the devil incarnate and he told him that there were acts of sheer evil he had perpetrated against these young boys as they were and as they were giving evidence and the judge summed up all of the evidence both you know what the defense had put forward on behalf of Bennell and what the prosecution had claimed the judge told the jury uh, last week when they went out he told them to remember that you're looking at middle-aged men in the witness stand giving their evidence here but to remember that they were little boys playing football when they had the misfortune to meet this man Barry Bennell. He was prosecuted under the name Richard Jones, which is one of about 15 aliases, as I understand it, that he has used over the years to avoid detection and, and people finding him. He was brought to court this morning, 9.27am he was driven into Liverpool Crown Court and then sentencing got underway at 12.15. So he has those judges' words ringing in his ears now. He's 64. The likelihood is Bennell will die in prison. But as the judge told him before, he said, take him down. He has left behind a trail of psychological destruction in his wake. And I understand that a further 86 men, in addition to all of the previous convictions, a further 86 men have now come forward to police with claims that they too were sexually abused by Barry Bennell while playing football in the north of England in the 80s. And the police will be looking at that now. I know that we're going to be hearing from the police very shortly, aren't we, uh, in the form of Detective Inspector Sarah Oliver from uh, Cheshire Police. This has been quite an investigation for the police. It has been a huge investigation for the police, and there are other investigations as well still ongoing. Manchester City, top of the Premier League. It was a very, very different club in the 80s when Bennell was uh, a scout. He was never officially employed on a salary basis by City, but certainly part of his modus operandi was grooming parents and he would approach parents at football matches and 
everything that has been said in court, he was an extremely talented football coach. He was very, very good at spotting young talent. Some of his players went on to have extremely successful careers. But as the judge has just said in his sentencing remarks, Benel was driven by one purpose, and that was the industrial scale abuse of young children. So Manchester City have launched their own investigation. It has been going on for some 15 months. They are urging anyone who was abused by Benel to come forward in complete confidence to them. They have offered their heartfelt sympathy to all those young players who were abused by Benel. And Manchester City have told us that they are trying to establish whether their football club was basically used as a vehicle for Benel to abuse young players. Crew Alexandra also um, have launched an investigation. He was a, a, a coach there for many years. And some of the men just coming now. I'll just um, step out of the way, Kay, as we just uh, hear from the men themselves. Yeah, we're just getting, just getting the other lads here. Yeah, I do. These are some of the victims of Barry Bennell who have supported right each other then, throughout this um, court case, ready with their statements. I am Gary Cliff. I am a survivor of abuse from Barry Bennell. I have waited two and a half years for justice to be done. Today, Bennell has been sentenced for committing crimes against me and 11 other survivors. The offences happened when we were children, now we are men. We did not forget. We came after you, Bennell, and now you are imprisoned due to us. If any more survivors wish to come forward and unlock the suffering, please do so. The hurt is not yours to carry, it is his. I would just like to say a heartfelt thank you to my wife, Emma, all my family, friends, Staffordshire Police, who I work for, Cheshire Police for the investigation, and support also to all the survivors who have now come forward who are very brave and special people. Thank you. My name is Mickey Fallon. As survivors of Barry Bunnell's crimes and cruelty, we welcome the sentence that the judge has handed down today. It reflects the severity and the seriousness of the crimes he has committed, as well as the pain and distress <coughs> that he has put us through for all of our lives and also the distress that he has put us through every day of this trial. But today marks an important milestone. We can now move on with our lives, safe in the knowledge that our abuser is locked away and can no longer cause us any harm. Today, we looked evil in the face and we smiled because by now, we have won. Today, we hand our shame and our guilt and our sadness back to you. It should never have been ours to carry in the first place. And tomorrow we go forward, united in justice, with a growing army of survivors. Through organisations like the Offside Trust, we will work to make sure that children are safe in all sports at every level. The sentence today sends a message to those who abuse children and those who cover it up. The world has changed. Truth now has a voice and it will be held accountable and punished accordingly. Thankfully, the judicial system has acknowledged his crimes and the sentence recognises his unrelenting depravity. The police, CPS, jury and now the judge have all recognised the truth. We thank them for that. Throughout this trial, Benno has shown not one ounce of remorse, not one shred of decency. He is calculated, devious and scheming. He was then, and he is now. But he has finally been held to account for his horrific crimes against children. To anyone else suffering in silence, we say, please tell someone, anyone, it will be the first day of the rest of your life. And every person that speaks out makes it more difficult for predators to succeed in the future. We will now continue to focus on supporting survivors through the work of the Offside Trust and making sure that the outpouring of support and solidarity of the last few days materialises into practical steps 
to try and prevent this happening again. People hold positions of trust. Be they sports coaches, teachers or clergy have a responsibility to safeguard the children in their care. The abuse of that trust is a crime against one of the most fundamental tenets of society, the protection of innocent, vulnerable children. Finally, I'd like to say to the public and the media for all your sensitivity in the last few weeks and days and for the overwhelming kindness and support we have received from every corner of the world. This is a testament to the belief that love will always conquer evil. Thank you. the survivors, uh, abuse survivors as they have described themselves rather than victims of Barry Bennell, our ex-football coach, jailed for 31 years today at Liverpool Crown Court for 50 counts of child sexual abuse. It's the fourth time he has been convicted of paedophile offences. Um, you can see just uh, how emotional some of those survivors are. They've uh, gone back to court day after day to support each other in their hour of need. Today, he was uh, sentenced to at least 31 years in jail, in all likelihood, given that he's in his 60s. He will die in prison. We've heard from the judge uh, summing up, saying that he was the devil incarnate. Let's go straight back up to Liverpool, should we? And uh, we're joined by Chris Unsworth. He's a survivor of abuse by Barry Bannell. Hi, Chris, thanks for joining us. Um, Talk to us no about, uh, in as much or as little detail as you want to about what happened to you. Uh, basically, I was groomed by Bernal from the age of eight um, until basically when I walked away from football at 14. Um, there, um, I had the whole life ahead of me, wanted to become a professional footballer, um, but when I walked away from football, I never wanted to play the game again. You obviously wanted to talk to people, tell people what was happening to you. Uh, that proved impossible at the time. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it took me a long time. It took me 35 years to come out and speak about anything to do with my, my abuse. And that was only because I saw Andy Woodward uh, on the Victoria Derbyshire show. Um, and it was only then that I realised I had to. Uh, I had to speak out. Why? Why was that, Chris? Did you think that people wouldn't believe you? I j personally, uh, I just put it in a box and totally forgot about my abuse, which was very hard to do, uh, and it was a tough thing to do and carry on your own sh shoulders. But um, yeah, I didn't. I don't think anyone would believe me. Um, I thought I was dirty and filthy. Um, but having the strength to see Andy come forward gave me the strength to come forward and uh, I'm so glad I did because there's a huge weight lifted off my shoulders and hopefully um, with other survivors out there that may be listening to this, it gives them some strength to maybe come out and speak about their abuse. Did you think that, it, I mean, did you feel, you were a young boy, you were only little, did you feel that it was just you? Uh, no, I know it was. Uh, I knew it was everyone that I used to play football with um, in the days when I used to play for Benel. Um, it was a kept secret by the boys. We never talked about it. It was just one of those sordid, horrible secrets that we just didn't speak about. It took a long time, didn't it, to come uh, to into the public light? Did you? There must have been times when you thought that it never would. Um, I knew that it was, it was going to be big as soon as obviously Andy broke the lid on it um, and we sat there and talked and we knew, we knew how big it would be um, but probably we didn't realise how big but we certainly knew it was going to be big. Mm. And what impact would you say that it had on you, uh, in, on your life as you were growing up? You said that you walked away from football, you didn't want to have anything to do with football anymore but it must have impacted on every aspect of your life. Yeah, very much so. It's impacted on, on my relationships. Um, 
uh, it impacted me um, where I've had uh, an operation so I didn't have children. That's how much it has affected me. Um, I, just, I just felt that I couldn't bring a child into this world knowing there was people like Benel round and about. Goodness, that, that is some decision to have to make. Yeah, it was, a, it, it was a tough one, but um, it was my decision, um, and that's something that I have to live with. He has... You've seen him in court from, from time to time, or you've seen um, the way that he's been behaving towards the survivors. Um, what emotions were you feeling about him during that time? Were you frightened of him still? No, I'm never frightened of him now. Um, I, always, I always wanted to have my day in court. I was hoping that uh, the day that I gave my uh, evidence that he would be there. Obviously, that was taken out of my hands uh, with the police and saying that he was going to do um, his, his through a video link. So I never had my day. So today was my day that I could look him in the eye. He didn't ever look up. He was always looking down or shaking his head. Never once did he uh, actually look at any of the victims. So, but I had my day in, and hopefully, I just wanted to make sure that there's, there was only one way that he was coming out of prison. When you looked at him today, what did you think? I didn't feel much. I didn't feel much. It's just a very lonely, selfish, horrible monster um, who I never wanted to see after today and hopefully <laughs> I don't think I ever will. The others, um, the survivors, you've, you, even when you'd all given your evidence on separate days... You... Yeah, that was, that was very important. You know, we all knew what we went through um, and obviously seeing everyone, we were there. We were there for each other from day one, really, as soon as the trial started. And that was how we were going to leave it today. So we wanted to support every survivor there uh, and their families. Um, and that's what it's all about. We came here and we left here together. Some 80-odd people have come forward since, uh, since he was charged. Uh, and there could well be other prosecutions. What would you say to other people who have not yet come forward, who could still be victims because you, you know how hard it was for you to come forward so you can appreciate how other people must feel yeah I mean it's very hard to come forward and speak about this horrible horrible life that you sort of led as a child but to carry that burden for so long um, it's a long lonely road um, but speaking to people speaking with lads a couple of lads there a couple of survivors now in the space of two or three days uh, that have spent time with us and the rest of the boys are completely different men um, and that's because you know they're not on their own now so if there is anybody out there that's thinking about coming out and speaking about their abuse please do so it's it's a long lonely road on your own and we're here to help we set up the organization called the offside trust for survivors by survivors and that's what we're here for um in all likelihood, I mean, he got 31 years today. The judge saying he was the devil incarnate. In, in all likelihood, he will die in jail. Do you have any sympathy for this man at all? How do, how do you feel towards him now? I don't feel anything towards him. As I said, I, I wanted him. The only way he could come out of prison is in a coffin. And that's how I feel. We appreciate you taking the time uh, to talk to us. Thank you so much. I realise how challenging it is still. But you've got the other survivors around you and together you're, you're uh, finding strength in numbers. We appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. Thanks a lot. No problem. Thank you. Well, you heard Gary Cliff, one of the survivors of abuse at the start of that clip. He joins us now live. Hi, Gary. Thank you uh, for joining us. Um, <clears throat> it's been a long road, hasn't it? Hello, Kay. Yes, uh, for myself, I made the complaint in September 2015. So it's getting on for two and a half years for myself, so it's been a long old road. How have you managed to support each other during that time? I know I was talking to one of your um, fellow survivors earlier on today and he was saying even after people had given evidence, you still came every day uh, to support each other. 
Yes, that's been uh, one of the positives, if you can take any, um, since Andy Woodward in 2016 blew the roof off it. Um, we've, we've managed to sort of support each other by getting in touch and, and really giving us that support because we know we've gone through that together and th they know how I feel and vice versa. Also the support from friends, family, I've, I've got a really strong network and also my employers have been um, absolutely immense in supporting me. Can you talk to us about what happened to you? Obviously only tell us as little or as much as you want to. Yes, Kay, uh, it's been well documented in the court, but um, suffice to say I've got seven counts uh, found unanimous guilty of um, ranging from touching right through to um, oral penetration, as it was back then, and that was, a, it was another part of this case, twist and turns of, it was under the old legislation, of course, which would have been rape nowadays. Uh, it, was, it was obviously called something different pre, pre the new legislation but um, you know the, the full horrific abuse um, from touching right through to rapes. You felt that you couldn't talk to anybody about it at the time when you were little? No absolutely not. Uh, I, you're a child you simply haven't got the words, you haven't got the vocabulary um, no other boys were saying anything. We were looking at each other and we had that horrible kind of look, uh, but we could never verbalise it. No parents were saying anything, no club officials were saying anything, and all the way along the line you'll see in this was officials burying their heads and not challenging his behaviour. But I can honestly say, I want Kay, if I can say, none of the parents knew, and this should not carry any guilt at all. No, but there were other adults who um, potentially were certainly turning a blind eye to what was happening at the club and the like and did, and did nothing to help the l youngsters like you? Um, sorry, I didn't quite get that. The, the officials at the club? Yeah, some, pe some, some adults knew, certainly were turning their face away from what could potentially have been happening and did nothing to support youngsters like you. Well, yeah, if that's, if that's the case, um, certainly from my side, I was, a, I was a Man City player and it's well documented in um, documentaries done in the written word that people at that club, Manchester City, uh, knew strongly what he was and did not challenge his behaviour and let him then move on to crew Alexandra and, and it, it goes on, the people burying their heads. Um, what impact did it have on you as you were growing up? Oh, absolutely horrific. Um, if I've said this in other interviews in the police statement. Dreaded weekends from the age of 11 through to 15. Uh, dreaded Christmas, hate Christmas because I was spending it with him, waking up with him Christmas Day, staying there Christmas Eve. Um, holidays abroad. Um, you, you get locked in and you feel complicit. Once you go along with it, I know I'm wrong and it's irrational, but you go along with it once, you, you go the next week, you go the next week, you feel complicit in it and you're kind of locked in. Mental health, massive issue. The, the guys, your guys that have been in court today, all the way along the line the, from the victim personal statements, there's a, a, we've all saying the same thing about the mental health side of it, PTSD, etc. Uh, the shame, embarrassment, that's, that's a massive part of it. That'll never leave us. What made you come forward? Was it Andy in the end? No, no, it wasn't. I, I didn't. I came forward well before Andy Woodward. I, I spoke to the police in the 90s when he got arrested in, in America. Uh, they came, found me. My name kept cropping up. I told them everything, but I didn't have the stomach back in the 90s to follow it through. Um, and it was a sense in 2015 September, it was a sense of not one, not regretting coming forward. It, you know, it, it took me that long to think I do not want to be sat in my 70s and old age regretting not doing anything. So I picked the phone up and made the call to Cheshire Police. I'm a survey detective. I wrote my own statement, 
And it, they came the following day and I, I gave them, handed over my nine page statement and said, there you go. I was on my own for 18 months, uh, drifting along under the radar. And it, it was, I've only come forward, I guess, in terms of my anonymity due to Andy. Otherwise, I'd probably gone under the radar, but I obviously started it well before him blowing the roof off it. Mm. Did you did you turn did you want to be a police officer because of what had happened to you and you felt that the law would eventually help people like you? Um, to, uh, to a certain extent, Kay, okay. yeah, I, I felt as though that I'd, I'd be in that sort of environment of safety uh, of joining the police, and I've, I've got to say that the people I work with have been absolutely phenomenal, and they I work in the CID. And I can assure you, we do our best and we turn the stones over um, with serious matters such as sexual cases and any other serious crime. Um, we, we do work tirelessly. I know we get a bad rap, uh, but uh, that's how it is. What did you think when you saw him today? Uh, very emotional. Um, all that horrible stuff in my stomach, churning, um, atmosphere in court. Um, he showed no remorse, uh, he never said a word. Um, I did my victim personal statement, uh, I, re I read that out, and then I walked um, towards him because he'd got his head down and I just shouted, Barry, and he locked up and uh, I said, why? And, and that was enough for me and I turned and walked away. Um, so, mixed emotions. He'll die in jail, probably. How does that make you feel? Sorry, I didn't catch that. He'll die in jail, probably, I would have thought. 30-odd years, he's already in his 60s. Um, do you have a view on that? Yes. Yeah, sorry, OK, just got... Um, do you know, I take, I take no pity from... Uh, sorry, I pity the man. I take no uh, triumph uh, from somebody dying in prison. I just feel so sad that he, I truly believe he was born that way. He was born as a paedophile to want to have sex with children I just pity it so much in the trail of destruction he is left behind thanks for joining us we appreciate it thank you thanks Kate thank you what bravery there a lot of bravery the former football coach Barry Bennell has been sentenced to 31 years for abusing 12 young footballers he trained in the 1980s. Bennell, who was convicted of more than 50 child sexual offences, coached at a number of clubs, including Manchester City and Crew Alexandra. The judge called the 64-year-old the devil incarnate. Our sports editor Dan Roan reports. They came seeking closure. The victims of Barry Bunnell, accompanied by their families, arriving at court for the sentencing of British sport's most notorious paedophile. Their abuser, meanwhile, arriving by a different entrance after being found guilty of 50 counts of child sex crimes. Having appeared throughout his trial via video link due to ill health, today Bunnell was here in person as he was handed a 31-year prison sentence. The 64-year-old impassive as he sat staring at the floor of the dock as his punishment was read out. Inside court, the cries of yes from the public gallery were hushed. Outside, the emotion able to flow. Today, we looked evil in the face and we smiled because by now, we have won. Today, we hand our shame and our guilt and our sadness back to you. It should never have been ours to carry in the first place. The care and diligence he took in grooming the victims and their families is amongst the most manipulative behaviour ever seen. He was a predatory paedophile, and to this day, there is no evidence that he has any remorse or regret for the dreams he has shattered and the lives he has damaged. Sentencing Bunnell judge Clement Goldston told him, to these boys you appeared as a god. In reality, you were the devil incarnate. You stole their childhoods and their innocence to satisfy your perversion. His abuse, the judge said, was sheer evil. Several of the former football coaches' numerous victims read out impact statements in court, among them Gary Cliff, abused by Bunnell when he played for a Manchester City junior team. In a bid to force Bunnell to make eye contact, Cliff approached the dock after his statement, asking, why, Barry, why, before being led away by an official. What was that experience like for you? 
I was churned up inside Dan but I was determined this was my moment I didn't want to regret not doing it so I stood up there as you were in court you saw it and as I said said me words uh, directed towards him Another 86 people have made complaints against the former Manchester City and Crew Alexandra youth team coach and amid hundreds of allegations against other suspects, both clubs are braced for civil lawsuits from victims. The ramifications of British football's gravest crisis are far from over. Dan Rowan, BBC News, Liverpool. The paedophile football coach Barry Bennell has been jailed at Liverpool Crown Court for 30 years for abusing 12 young footballers he coached between 1979 and 1991. Half of the term will be served in custody, with the rest on licence, with an additional licence period of one year. The judge labelled him the devil incarnate. Jane Deet is in Liverpool, where victims spoke to the press outside the court with their supporters behind them. When they were boys, Barry Burnell told them no one would believe them. They've waited 30 years to see the man who stole their childhoods get justice. Surrounded by well-wishers, they had this message for their abuser. We did not forget, we came after you, Bennell, and now you are imprisoned due to us. If any more survivors wish to come forward and unlock the suffering, please do so. The hurt is not yours to carry, it is his. Today, we looked evil in the face and we smiled because by Bennell, we have won. Today, we hand our shame and our guilt and our sadness back to you. It should never have been ours to carry in the first place. The world has changed. Truth now has a voice. Barry Bunnell, who worked for Crew Alexandra and had links with Manchester City, was seen as a god by the young footballers and their trusting parents. He used his access and power to relentlessly abuse boys. The judge told him, you were the devil incarnate. You stole their childhoods and innocence to satisfy your own perversion. It barely seemed to register with Bunnell. He stared at the floor, once or twice, shaking his head. Barry Bunnell will probably spend as long in prison as many of the boys he abused have suffered in secret. Today, in powerful victim statements, they found the words and the same words came up again and again. Confusion, shame, guilt, hell. Mickey Fallon was on Crew Alexandra's youth team when Bunnell started abusing him. I came forward after 32 years. By the time it's come to trial, it's been 33 years. Um, there is a bit of significance in, in that. Um, if he suffers half as much as what a lot of us have done for 30 odd years, so he should. Some of the victims may bring civil claims against the clubs where they encountered Bunnell. He used fear to control them as boys, but through their courage in court, they have found power. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.